things that we often talk about is how, how to communicate science. But I'm also interested in why it is important to communicate science. And one of the things, um, Angela, I hope Angela is still here, yes, because one of the, the things that she recently did was an interview with me, and she referred to me as the accidental scientist, because that's really how I came to be a scientist. I had no dream of being a scientist. I didn't grow up saying, you know, falling in love with dinosaurs and saying, I'm going to be a scientist to study these dinosaurs. I really, very accidentally came into science, came into biology, and eventually did a PhD in this area. So for me, it is very important that we actually communicate science to the wider public to showcase how wonderful it is to be able to understand the world in which we live. I also don't think that everybody needs to be a paleontologist, of course, because one of the most important things that I've realized is that for our country to, to grow, to, uh, for our country to develop, we need good science. And one of the things that we have such an incredible dire shortage is human resources in science, engineering, and technology. And so for me, I find that I communicate my science, but I hope that when I talk about my work, people will also understand that it's just one aspect of science. There's so much more that people can do in science. But even in communicating my science, I find that everybody loves dinosaurs, but there's still some challenges that we have. Can I? Okay, oops, no. Let's go on. There we go. Okay, there's still challenges in the way in which science is communicated. Is it possible to put some light on the front? First slide. Yes. No. Okay, so there's still some challenges in terms of communicating. Oops, sorry, I shouldn't have been telling you too much. So, for example, in terms of understanding the geological time scale, often I find people find it very difficult to understand three months ago or three years ago. That's perfect. But to try and understand things in terms of billions of years ago is very complex. So this is one of the challenges I often have. I find people have difficulty understanding what fossils are. And I also find that one of the biggest problems is the negative stereotypes that people have about science, about who does science, who is capable of doing science, and also about the fact that should there be women in science, or is, uh, are women capable of doing science. So these are the stereotypes that exist in our society. And of course, the big one is evolution, is what a lot of people grapple with as well. So these are sometimes the challenges that I often face when I'm talking to my audiences. And one of the things that I feel is really absolutely important is that one has to engage with your audience. One has to be able to not just explain, but engage and enter into a dialogue about what it is you're trying to understand and trying to showcase. So in terms of just understanding um, the fossil record and how we actually understand when things came to be and when they originated, one can see that if you just tell people about it, it's very difficult. But if you can actually show, show them the fossils and try and explain how one finds the fossils and how these rocks are actually dated, you then have a better chance of conveying your message about uh, time scales in terms of deep time. Another thing that I think is important is that when we're talking to an audience, and for me this is what I find, is that one has to always make it relevant. So relevance to, to the audience is absolutely vital. And I know that in schools these days they are teaching about um, evolution, they are looking at geological time, and one of the things that I, I do also as a scientist, so it, part of my talk I should just quickly say is that I'm talking about what I do in terms of science communication and how I communicate my work. So that's my brief for today. So 
I, I developed this poster that people, the teachers or anyone else can freely download and it's something that is accessible because what, I, what people need to understand is that if you look at the history of life on Earth, not all of these organisms were around at the same time. But what we do see is that the fossil record tells us and gives us information about when different life forms originated, when they diversified, and when they became extinct. And of course, this goes hand in hand with trying to understand how the continents also moved at different times. And by just in a simple chart like this, one can actually see there's so much that a teacher could possibly talk to the students about. And when talking about dinosaurs, I always try to make it relevant by talking about dinosaurs in Africa. So instead of talking about dinosaurs from North America or China, but rather bring them <coughs> home and tell people about South African dinosaurs or African dinosaurs, and I think that's really very, very important. Again, Making it relevant in terms of African dinosaurs, so this is Carcharodontosaurus, one of the largest theropod dinosaurs in the world, found here in Africa, but also relevant in terms of a human hand, I'm uh, sorry, a human hand showing in comparison to a size of one of these teeth, and a human skull in comparison to the Carcharodontosaurus, just so that you can explain this idea about scale, because if I told you that that skull was 1.6 meters in size, for many people it's difficult to understand 1.6 meters, but showing a human skull next to the skull actually immediately conveys this idea about how big this animal is. And yet again, other African dinosaurs, <coughs> so these are basically just again African dinosaurs and the scale is compared to people that are around, so you can get an idea about size and scale again. And this one is an interesting one. This was just found two years ago in Argentina. And in fact, I was so fortunate to visit this particular museum. As this dinosaur was being uncovered and brought into the museum. And this is one of the, the femurs, the thigh bone, compared to me. And you can again see a very, very large dinosaur. But if I just told you 40 meters long and stood 20 meters tall, it's difficult to understand. But putting somebody that they can relate to immediately next to that bone, again, conveys how enormous the dinosaur is. So especially when I'm talking to children, I, I usually try to, to bring them fossils and try to make scales very apparent. Um, I've written this very nice uh, popular level book on famous dinosaurs of Africa and it's hard to believe that after more than 150 years of studying African dinosaurs, this is the only book on African dinosaurs. So a lesson here is that we need to write our stories. We shouldn't be waiting for African science or African articles to come out from elsewhere because we need to write about our biota and I think this sense of pride has to come from us. And I think these are one of the ways in which we can actually help children understand our heritage as well. This is a Lequibasaurus Swazi. It's the only Isikosa named dinosaur. And you can understand why. <laughs> because other people that name the dinosaurs were not going to name it by an African name. And this is, again, a proudly South African dinosaur. This is um, another uh, way in which I try to, to get public interest in science. And whenever I write a, um, an article um, for an academic journal, I always write a press release. No matter how complicated the topic is, I always try to make it relevant and to make it accessible to the public. And this one is not a dinosaur from Africa. This is actually um, a four-winged dinosaur from China that I was involved uh, in the description of. And it's a fascinating animal. And even though it's not from South Africa, I really thought our public, the South African public, would be really excited to know about these dinosaurs. 
that had wings not only on the forelimbs but even on their hind limbs. And sure enough, there was a lot of media interest in this. So my research, as I mentioned and, and Alex mentioned, is about bone and bone structures. And more often than not, this is what I look at under a microscope, the actual microscopic structure of bones themselves. And using the bone microstructure, I'm able to then understand some um, aspects of the biology of prehistoric animals, so of dinosaurs, of other extinct animals that we no longer uh, can see, but if we study their bones, we can actually get some information about their biology from their bones. And this is the area that I work on. And using these bone microstructures, we can have some fascinating insight into the world of prehistoric animals. And this is, again, a, um, an early bird, Confucius Ornus, so one guess where it comes from. Confucius Ornus from China, of course. And basically, we had a wonderful paper looking at bone microstructure of these Confucius Ornus birds. And by using these bones, we were able to, to understand which were males and which were females. So that was one of the first for understanding um, an extinct animal's gender. And this again is one of the recent papers that came out of my lab. It's myself and a postdoc in my lab. And I'm sure some of you may have seen the, the, the new paper that came out on the dodo. It actually, it made it into CNN, it was in Times, it was really everywhere. I mean, even the Guardian had an article. It really grabbed people's attention. And the information, again, that we developed was based on the bone microstructure of these dodo birds. But if we, if we just wrote about just the bones and the histological structure, we wouldn't actually be able to communicate this to the public. But what we did was we uh, wrote it in such a way that people could understand the information that we deciphered from the bones that allowed us to say so much about the biology of the dodo. And this is fascinating because until now, we didn't actually know as much as we do today about these birds and about their biology in terms of their reproduction, in terms of their molting. All this information is what we were able to decipher from the bones themselves. And I think this is creating the relevance and trying to show people that science is not actually static. Science grows by new information, new findings, and constantly there is new developments that take us even further. And when I talk to young people, I always try to emphasize the point that they can also contribute to science in the future if they have something that they're interested in. So I think these are points that I often like to make. One of the things about, again, um, um, relevance and trying to understand evolution and trying to understand the history of life on Earth, these are big issues and people do have a problem trying to understand them. And when I looked in the literature, there's all these books that, are, that, that you can read up about, but they, they don't have relevance for South Africa, they don't have relevance for Africa, because people can't actually um, find the linkages. They, they're so far away from what they know. But if, if we look at this book that I wrote, actually just published two years ago by Cambridge University Press, it really uses African material. It talks about the oldest rocks in the world. And I can tell them about rocks in Greenland, I can tell them about rocks in, uh, in the North Pole, but why not talk about rocks from Barberton? You know, this is what people need to understand, that there are important places here in South Africa that you can actually relate to, that you can actually understand, and in many, many cases, you can actually visit these places that are mentioned in this book. And so I think this is also very important. And the other thing that I try to do is I try to capitalize on what is happening at that particular time. So what's in the news? 
So the Jurassic world came out, just as all the other Jurassic parks, and the Jurassic 1, 2, 3, and 4, there was lots of media interest. And I had so many journalists call me to ask me about what was actually the fact part of this and what was fictional part of it. And so I wrote an article that I published online about the fact and fiction of uh, Jurassic World. But, of course, once the article was out there, I was asked then to speak in various forums about, about the fact and fiction of Jurassic World. And so I did talks at the Science Center and summer school and museums. So, you know, this is basically what, once there's something in the news, as scientists, I think we can also use the opportunity to tell people <coughs> about what is actually the real science behind some of what, is, what we're actually hearing about. So I think there's certainly opportunity to engage with people about these issues. And then, very recently, I decided, this was last year, I decided that with all the hype about uh, online and online courses, I'll actually try to do something online. And I developed uh, with the University of Cape Town an online course called Extinctions Past and Present. And this was for me a whole new ballgame. I mean, as you see, I've published books, I've done so many talks, and I decided this is something that I would like to do. And I should tell you that my course has run for one year now. It's, it's, we've had three different runs, and in each of them we've had really such a fabulous turnout. It's been one of the most rewarding things that I've done. And I believe that this is the way in which we need to, to look at science communication as well. This is The reach is just wide. One of the ways that I try to, uh, to, to make the course more engaging than having just a, a one person talk about their science all the time, I brought in many different people. And by doing this, I showcase the diversity that is there in science. So I try to show uh, men, women, white people, black people, young people, old people, just diversity because otherwise, Kids don't understand, they don't see their role models, they don't see the people that are like themselves talking about science. And I think this is the way young people today, if you, if you have young kids or if you know children, you know that at every opportunity they have, they like to be online. And this is the way in which we can reach them. Also, try to negate some of the stereotypes about what scientists do. So not all paleontologists actually are in the field all the time. There's also lab work, there's also uh, work that needs to be done in the lab. So this also gets translated in this kind of way. One of the things that I was very surprised about was the, the wide range of people that actually signed up for the course. It took us by surprise because my course is Extinctions Past and Present, developed here locally, but of course it was on the UK Open University platform called Future Learn, and as a result, we had a worldwide participation. The most number of people were actually from the UK. More than 1,600 people from the UK participated in the course, and actually this is a heat chart, so basically this dark blue is the most, and then you can see next was US and South Africa. And what was interesting that until my course, there was only 1% participation on the Future Learn platform from South Africa. But when my course ran, we had 11% South Africans actually participate. So that was quite interesting because we didn't expect it. And the other thing that was completely unexpected, and even I had a student from the UK, from Oxford, come and see me because they said they didn't think that a course from South Africa would have such broad reach. And this is just to show you how we can actually extend our reach so much further by just going online. So this is in terms of the different continents. You can see um, we had in total from Africa 14% which again was quite an increase because usually the future learn average is only 4%. And I tried 
very, very hard. I mean, even 14%, I was disappointed with because I really wanted this course to, 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 to go much further in Africa. And I tried to market it, tried to use my linkages, and try and really get this course out there. But, I mean, everybody says I should be happy with 14%, but I'm not. And I'm still working hard. If any of you have any ideas how to take it even further, you please just contact me. It's really free and it runs every few weeks. The course actually runs. It's a few months, I should say. And of course, the best news is that when Class Central released their 2017 um, list of top 50 MOOCs, ours was one of them. So we are on the top 50 MOOCs in the world. And I say this, and I think all of you should be proud, not just me, because my course is not just about me, there's several other people who will participate in it, but this is top 50 out of more than 7,400 MOOCs that are offered worldwide by 8,500 universities. So it's quite an, an accomplishment. So if you haven't already done it, it's a free online course. You look, look for it under futurelearn, futurelearn.com. And basically, the next run starts in uh, February 2018. The reviews have all been quite raving, as you can understand. Being a top 50 MOOC, it didn't just get there because it, was, it wasn't good. It actually had, people have enjoyed it um, thoroughly. And I think what they liked about it was the different ways in which we try to communicate the science. So we had lectures. We had interviews and we had site visits. So by having all these different ways in which we communicated it, I think it made it really much more engaging. So, and just in a nutshell, I we try to make science accessible by making it engaging, by making it relevant, by actually riding the waves of what is hot, what is new, what is current. And then I think very importantly, oops, in South Africa, is to showcase the visibility, to, to give visibility about diversity, about the different kinds of people that are able to enter into science. So science is not just for men, not just for women, it's for everybody. Anybody who is interested, who has the, the willingness and the, the, the desire to want to explore the world around them can come into science. And I think for, for researchers trying to communicate science, from all the different ways in which I talk about science, I really feel that it's imperative that we also embrace the online media. And we go online and try to broaden and reach even wider by, by going online and uh, reaching more people in this way. So that's all that I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh,